I'm Stephanie. Hi, I'm Angela. We are the Ink Mages. Join us as we discuss all things fantasy, world building, story craft, myths and legends, and of course, our own imaginative stories. I'd love if you could tell us a little bit about how it is that you craft even the sound of, like you said, you know, you sometimes you come up with idioms or things that people say very clearly as you go through the world with Rowan and even some of the books that I've read that are attached to this world that, you know, I've been fortunate enough to get to get a sneak peek through. You have almost a way of writing accents and a different way of a rhythm of talking to the different nations, which I just find absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, I'm thinking of writing a, uh, paranormal thriller here in a few books from now. And I'm sitting here going, I've lived in Ireland. I know what people sound like, but I'm still struggling. How do I write that accent? <laughs> you know, and that's a huge part of storytelling and even being immersed in the culture for a while. I'm still kind of like, how do you do that? What do you do when you're trying to come up with how they speak? Are you, are you watching things, listening to things? Like, how do you do that? Um, well, I loved watching BBC shows, <laughs> so I feel like naturally my uh, characters might have a more English way of speaking. So um, my Mestrian Empire kingdom, they have a specific way that's very much more like high society sounding or kind of like old English, very proper. Uh, the knights and the nobles won't use contractions. Everything is just like kind of old fashioned in a way as if they were talking 500 years ago in court. Yes. So that kind of sets them apart. But yet in the slums of the, the capital city, I have them speaking kind of like how street kids would speak um, like in the alleys of London, mm -hmm. you know, so they've got their own little slang. They don't speak properly. <laughs> They'll, you know, um, and then I've got like sailors on that are from a different kingdom that speak very much almost like piratey. I, I swear my, very reader, well. it's so funny. my, my yeah. readers thought they were pirates. They're like, oh, we loved your pirates. I'm like, but they weren't pirates. <laughs> 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 they were just sailors. But, you know, I used more of a Scottish brogue mm. with them, which is like super fun. And I had a sweet lady friend of mine who was uh, an older lady named Kathy and she was Scottish. So she loved using little Scottish terms. When we would hang out, she would say like, you know, let's go oot in a boot. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, she, she had all these fun little like sayings. So I kind of picked up on that and she gave me this Glasgow Bible which was oh. awesome. So it had like the major stories of the Bible, but spoken and written out in a brogue, a heavy brogue um, dialect. So I kind of used that as a map, like a oh, road map, beautiful. and yeah. how to write out um, linguistically how I want my sailors to sound. And I scaled it back a little bit because I had beta readers who didn't know what my care, what my sailors were saying half the time. Yes. <laughs> so had to scale back a little bit. Those were some of the things that I did that I didn't know I would find myself doing in the middle of writing my story was learning to speak Welsh. <laughs> I, you know, cause I wanted the magical words when a Druid would speak to be like old English or old, uh, an older language. And I decided to settle cause there's a Welsh speaking people on Welsh. And, you know, you can go to Google Translate and you can put in, you know, English to Welsh and, and do it that way. But, you know, you, you're just not confident that you're actually getting the words right. So I found myself actually taking Welsh speaking classes on Duolingo. Don't ask me to speak it. <laughs> I but didn't I, know you did that. Yes, I did. For uh, two years, I took Welsh. And um, it was really fun and it really did help me order the words. And I still don't think I probably did it perfectly. If a Welsh person were to pick up my books, I, I probably, you know, they'd be like, this isn't how you say it. And, you know, who knows? But I tried my best. I actually went down that road of learning the language so that I could understand how to construct a basic sentence and how words could sound. And um, I'm even, I looked up, this is totally off the subject, but I'm just putting it out there for people who want to do audiobooks. I did find on Fiverr 
uh, a Welsh speaking um, book voice artist and he's really expensive, but it would be so cool to have him read my books because I know without a doubt he could read the Welsh words without having a problem. <laughs> Anyway, the language is really important if you're going to have, even if you're going to make up a language, how to construct that, what's it going to sound like, um, what does the people group feel like, and I love how you do that in your books. It's very clear, the, the different nationalities and the different even species of people, like what's, what's the word you would use that species, but race <laughs> there's the word <laughs> the different races of of beings in your book that it very clearly have their own um way of living and thinking and speaking that comes very clear across the page and even the design of the kingdoms i love how you paint the picture of uh, one of my favorite landscapes which is actually not in your conjurer's curse series hopefully you don't mind me talking about no. this I was going to go there if you didn't. Oh, okay, but it's the it's a a battle against red elves in a yes. and of uh, this red sand landscape. Talk about that for a little bit. I love that. Yeah, so um the uh, Randall, that is the yes, nation kingdom that I've created in the second book in my uh Clash of Kingdom series and it was inspired as I was driving through Arizona once. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what a bizarre landscape, because uh, living in Southern Oregon, I'm surrounded by evergreen trees and mountains. So Arizona was like this foreign place. And I was going to be having a character who's a knight go to this, this other kingdom for war, because there is, again, a, a commodity, you know, that the immortal king wants. And that's kind of how a lot of wars start. So, you know, uh, that's what lands him there. And it's just this crimson wasteland yes, set on plateaus. And where I live in Southern Oregon, we have these, this, these plateaus called table rocks. And they jut up from the landscape and they're flat and they're in the shape of like a horseshoe. So that kind of inspired how the setting would be kind of raised up. And then there's like slot canyons. And in these slot canyons, you would have this indigenous type group called Rang uh, Rang Rang the Rangali. And I describe them as like basically red elves because they've got the pointy ears and their skin's kind of red. And they live down there and they can just surprise, ambush my Mestrian soldiers who are foreign to this area. They don't know the landscape. So this group of people use it to their advantage. And when I was just coming up with their language, I kind of did a blend of Hawaiian and Japanese. Wow, that's me. And it's, I'm not even sure why, but maybe it's because um, my mom's from Hawaii. So we have a lot of Hawaiian influence in the family. Oh, that's neat. And I thought, well, I, and it's cool. And I would like, I want to create a language that is uh, heavily based on vowel sounds, mm. but then add a little bit of this Japanese flair to it. So it ended up creating almost like a ping pongy type sound language that's musical. Mm. Yeah. So that was fun. I had, I created it like it's uh, just its own, its own sound, its own style. And um, to jump to something else like in the race of Arjun yeah. within my magic system, like you are using Welsh terms, I just create words that sound good. <laughs> <laughs> like for to hear spells, I'm like, eh, maybe a Latin flair with a little bit of French and blah, just blend it together and see how it sounds. I think that's so fun. <laughs> that's where you get to be creative because again, you can take something that exists and then make it your own. Kind of like I even did with the songs or the ballads that are in my book. Like you can take something and then make it your own, take languages or landscapes and then you, it doesn't have to be specifically that thing. I think that's what the, the funnest thing about writing fantasy is that you get to be creative and take something and make it an entirely new idea or concept um, and just really make it magical. Uh, I like, I mean, I think that was J.R.R. Tolkien. He took a lot of Norse words, the sound of 
like Scandinavian words when he was developing the Elven language. It was his own, but he took the sounds that already inspired him, which I just think is fascinating. It's it's a really cool, I, I've, I'm still learning to, I haven't really tried to do my own language or my own words yet. <laughs> yes. Yet. <laughs> you never know, you know, because uh, again, you do, it is fun when you start jumping down that road of world building and story crafting the things that begin to develop and the things that you learn. I remember when I first started writing um, this trilogy, The Once in Future Chronicles, I just information dumped all the, the history and all the things right off the bat. And I learned later that it was better to take all of that information, all of the things that I felt were important and weave it throughout the story, throughout my character's experiences, instead of dumping it all in one space. Because the history, even if it is a completely high fantasy story, is an essential part of crafting a story to give a reader a bigger view of the world that you're building. And I have to say, even with your world, especially when you're you're not taking from something like a uh, landscape that already exists, like in my book, building within the reader a map without even having to see one, being able to mm -hmm. go, oh, this is north, and this is what it looks like over here, and being able to clearly see the different regions and have an idea and a concept can be kind of a difficult task, one that you pull off amazingly, because I really do get, for even from Rowan, going from the tropical islands up through Mestria and then through the forests um, and up into the north, you get this really clear idea of all the landscapes and a bigger world than kind of some of the smaller storytelling. And you can tell a story that's all in one region and just develop that one. But it is amazing when you start getting this concept of a bigger world with more people in it. Um, and how they're all affected in different ways by Mestria, really. Yes, and it. I feel like the more your story grows or the bigger the world comes, you're gonna deal with more of these more in-depth stuff like the social structure or the class structure, having a king and having vassals and uh, how do they all get along? You know, why would a kingdom invade another kingdom? Yes. You know, is there a, a resource they need? And so when I was um, writing The Conjurer's Curse and Rowan gets to the homeland of Shandria, which I had to realize, okay, what sets this kingdom apart? Why would they have been vassals to the Mestrian kingdom for a hundred years? What prompted that? And so I thought, okay, in a dialogue with uh, Rowan and Tahira, she, you know, he asked her, well, what's it like? You know, I'd be, if I was, you know, heading to my true homeland, I'd want to know everything about it. And she just said, oh, it's mountainous, you know, the land isn't very fertile. It's like, okay, so then if it's not super fertile, why would a, you know, a neighboring kingdom want to acquire it? And then she said, metallurgy. And it kind of like opened this door for, him, for me. And I'm like, oh, of course, like iron, like what, yeah. what would a kingdom need for war machines and for conquering other kingdoms. They might need iron for weapons, for siege machine, machines. And so it's like, that's what the people are gonna do. So then it created an entire society that is based on mining. Wow. And wow. then once you have mining, it's like, ah, so the expressions that people can say will have to do with iron or mining so yes. that's where i gotta really play because i could have characters you know say instead of we would say like what's bothering you my characters would say what's carding your ore you know <laughs> <Love that. laughs> um like oh you really like sunk the mine shaft on that level you know like you blew it basically yes. so i get to get really creative with um how my characters say things because what's common in Chandria would be completely new to Rowan. You know, his tropical island would say other things because they don't they don't mine. They yeah. they hunt and then they like they uh they do weave script and uh harvest pearls and grow barley. So like the culture is completely different. Yeah. Which I find, fan, I, the, to me, it's like so limitless when you really look at how you can develop a world um, and think about even the phrasing. Uh, and, you know, I was, 
I had to write something the other day where one of my warriors was like, going to say, you know, kind of swear a little bit. And I was like, well, what would they have said? You know, like, how would that have looked? And it came out horse dung, you know? I was like, that's what they would have said. You know, they would have said horse dung, you know? <laughs> I don't know. But you are, you're, think, you're constantly thinking this is a world that isn't within the normal construct or the frame of normal everyday life. They're living in a different right. world of history or in a different world altogether. How would they have thought about things and how would they have spoken? And I think that's, it actually becomes a really fun piece of writing because you're, it's like a painting. You're putting on all the layers of paint and all the colors mm -hmm. and bringing this world to life that people get to experience and be satisfied with. And the more you add those little details here and there, the more realistic feeling the world becomes. It, you convince your reader that what they're reading is a real world for the time that they're reading. And I think that's why story building is so essential and important. You know, even when, you know, I really wanted to rub out of people's imaginations that we were talking about castles and knights in my story, because this isn't medieval times. I mean, this might have been right. the beginning of the medieval court culture, but this is like pre-castles, like you said, pre, you know, wearing armor. Like they might have had a few little plates here and there like the Romans did because of their influence. But you mostly would have been dealing with hard leather. Or even yeah. beyond that, the Celts would have initially been battling naked, painted blue. And so I had kind of this oh my gosh. twist these two cultures because you had this, a period of time where the Romans had been influencing them with, you know, guarded armor, teaching them to use swords instead of maybe their weapon of choice, which is a spear. Um, and, you know, instead of... Uh, you know, horseback instead of on foot. That was something that the Celts wouldn't have done as much before the Romans came. And um, so I would twist in every now and then that these warriors would set themselves up with blue paint, with blue woad and with white clay in their hair because this was still a part of their culture. And then when I tried, it was actually really difficult for me to try to find description words to describe something that I knew uh, maybe a majority of people who don't know about Celtic culture would have known what their buildings look like. So I'm like, they're twisting, they're round, they're turning, they're stone structures. Um, and one of the fun facts is a lot of their um, monasteries or um, sacred spaces were made in a swirl tunnel on the inside because that's how the arteries of the heart work. So that they specifically made a swirl on the inside. So that when they got to the center, which was the epicenter of the heart, I um, mean, they would create these echoing rooms that they, you know, believed had more spiritual impact. And so a lot of the buildings that they built, even their homes or their big, you know, tower structures would have been circular and around um, and just one big, long, you know, circular tower. And so I was really trying to put that in people's minds. So this is a palisade that has a mixture of Roman towers and things that would have influenced their culture, but they still have this Celtic idea. And then you've got that almost Saxon um, influence too of these great halls and um, things that you would have seen in Lord of the Rings with. Um, right. You know, the, like the, the great right hall of Medestel. Exactly. Yes. You would have there had, go. Great hall, you had kind of this mixture of cultures and influence, which happens over time. And so trying to construct that in people's imaginations as they're reading um, was fun and also a challenge because I had to really imagine them myself. Like, what would this have looked like? I even had to research because there's an apple orchard. Yes. <laughs> in my stories, I'm like, do apples even grow in the north in England? Would it have been possible for them there to be an apple orchard? Could an apple orchard be on a hill and not in a valley? You know, all of those things. And some of those things you're like, ah, you know, it, it doesn't matter. This is, there's an apple orchard and it's on a hill and this is where yeah. it's going to be. But those are the things that are fun questions to ask yourself as you're building the landscape of a world. Was there any particular thing that was a challenge for you when you were developing one of your worlds? Wait, well, thank goodness, that... Yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> that was challenging. I guess because, you know, as we talked before we started, um, my adult fantasy series is very much of a natural mm -hmm. realism when it comes to abilities. I didn't have magic in it. I'm okay. I love like The Last Kingdom. I love medieval stories that aren't heavily magic 
you know, woven into them. So the challenge for me with the conjurer's curse is like, okay, well, I have a conjurer and she cursed somebody, you know, there's, there's people out there that can use magic. So I had to create my magic system for the first time. And uh, Rowan will get to a place where he can actually utilize his curse. And so that was a challenge, but also fun because it's like, I have to show this, you know, if you're going to put magic in your story, I need to know and see how it works. Don't just tell me all of a sudden your character is casting spells like off the fly. I'm like, "Mm, how does it work? Does he go into a zone? How does it affect his body? Um, So with Rowan's curse, it's like, I had to take some time to like, how does it feel when he uses it? Is there a consequence to his body to use it? Does he feel pain? How fast can his curse, because it's a life draining curse, how fast can it drain life? And I had to make sure I worked it in with the system that was established because like in the beginning of the story, you find out that his curse has killed people. And but it was over a slow period of time. So why was it over a slow period of time? And then if it's gonna, if he's gonna be able to speed up the process, why, you know, can he do that? So it's having this awareness of if I actually mentally am like in synergy with this curse, I can control it and manipulate it. So there was a challenge to kind of work it out and make sure I wasn't, you know, I was working within the system that had been established earlier in the story. And then it became fun because Which is what your readers want to know. Like they really, yeah. when I read a book, I do want to know like, well, how does this work? You want to, well, how does, you know, just like with anything, you know, if you're talking about even, you know, a bad guy or let's say whether it's vampires or werewolves, like what's the lore? Tell me about it. Is it yes. a typical lore? Is there more, what's, what do I need to know that's fascinating about these particular characters that are being written in this story, whether they've cursed or they have, or they have magic, like people want to know. And I remember reading a story one time where there was this character who's a side character. He came in and um, he was set up as kind of this kind of lowly servant. Um, And then all of a sudden he had this ability to heal people. And I remember it really bugged me because I was like, well, where did his magic come from? How did he do that? Like, I, and I just, why? Yeah. Why? You know? And, it was a side character. Did I really need to know that? And the answer was yes, I did. Even if it was just one sentence that told me where it was that he was able to learn this power so that in my brain it unlocked, oh, in this magic system, this is how he was able to accumulate this particular, without being anything special, like a bard or a magician or a wizard or a mage or whatever it is that, you know, is in your magic system. I wanted to know. And it bugged me that I didn't. And so, and it is amazing what I've learned about uh, world building and story crafting is how much you can say in a sentence or two. Yes. You don't have to go off and create a whole nother chapter or a whole nother section in your book. If you just hint at something or put one sentence in a conversation or something that yep. introduces your audience to this new reality or this concept, to the magic system, then all of a sudden the reader goes, aha, they find that nugget and it satisfies yeah. them. It's like a, a good, you know, morsel for them to discover. And you don't have to, you know, rewrite an entire book, but you can't betray your magic system. Once you've set it up or your world, once you've built it, you can't betray that system. So you do want to focus as a writer is keeping it within the rules that you built for yourself, which can be limiting sometimes, but it also helps you have to be creative in what you've constructed. Yes, because uh, magic is fun, but I I, lo- I like it when there's limits. Yes. Um, yes, so, you know, the power ceiling, there is a ceiling. Yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, I do like when a character can slowly develops the magic. So they're, they're kind of learning and growing with it. Um, so it's not just all of a sudden they have unlimited power right. at their fingertips. And then I feel like, well, now I can't really like kind of grow with you because I would feel like that's a great opportunity for there to be character development. Yes. Um, as when your character is realize they do have this gift, they do have this potential. There should be so many uh, questions that are going to go through their head. And we, as the reader want to like be in their head 
as they, you know, they realize this, how is this going to affect their life? How is this going to affect their relationships yes. with their friends or their family? Because they now have this gift or maybe it's a curse. So, yeah. you know, these are, that's part of the world building too, is, is the character themselves having um, these dilemmas that they're well, facing. I mean, there's the traditional, you know, Luke Skywalker scenario, you know, he discovers he's a Jedi. Yep. <laughs> now he's got to be trained and learn how to, and you get to go on that journey with him throughout the series getting super, you know, nerdy, but you know, where we arrive, where he's like a super master Jedi by the end, you know, yeah. that, that development, especially with your main characters is essential. Um, you know, and it is sometimes fun when a character is already immersed in that world of magic at the beginning of a story. But certainly if your character is being introduced to a magic, well, even I love yeah. that about Rowan. Rowan doesn't, he knows he's cursed or something's wrong with him, but he doesn't have all the answers. And that sets up a mystery that mm -hmm. makes a reader want to dive in and go, I want to know too. Plus you're cheering for him. Because you, the character from the get-go is very endearing. And so it, it makes the people want to bite in um, and explore this whole character's reality. Yeah. <laughs> I, have, I have done it. I have done it once for like, I guess in my adult series, when I have the shapeshifters, you know, I have a character who already knows how to shapeshift. So now it's more yes. about like inviting the reader in to like, how does that feel as it happens? So yeah. I've, I've done both. I've done both where, you know, the character learns they have a magic or a curse or an ability and they have to slowly over time develop it. And then I've done the opposite where I have characters that are fully immersed, fully like experts at what they do. And there are different dynamics that they have to overcome. So it's not about uh, developing this gift they've been given, but like, I need to hide this. I need to yes. conceal this because it is not accepted. Yes. Which, and there is that revolving yeah. evolution of their destiny and purpose. Yes. They're already having that, which uh, is an excellent way to tell a story. I super, I, I love the promised one scenario when, or the chosen one scenario yes. to a story. Like they might I think we secretly it. all love it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> story tropes, right? It's a good one. And I, I love that one, the the chosen one, even if they don't know it yet, because you're like, well, I want to believe that, that they can do something, especially when they're such great evil. I mean, we always want good to win in the end, which you have an amazing ability in your stories to really um, create such jeopardy and such evil bad guys that you're like wondering, I don't know, maybe the bad guys aren't going to win or the good guys aren't going to win. <laughs> And which yes. is, again, it's great because it keeps the reader going, okay, I got to keep reading because I know something, something good's around the corner. There's going to be some destiny or promise, some reason for all of this. Um, and it's, gonna, it, it's a fun way to tell a story. We will definitely like have to do a whole video on villains and crafting villains because I mean, in a sense that ties into world building, you will need a conflict yeah. in your story. And that's not always a villain, um, yeah. but writing villains they they can be they're difficult that's a challenge that's one yeah. of the, your question was the most challenging thing it's it, sometimes it's villains especially if you're going to tackle from their their point of view so love to do a video in the future on how to write villains coming this october yes villains right yes that's right <laughs> so everybody needs to tune in because we do we have a lot of really fantastic uh interviews coming up and we have a lot of fun plans for October talking about monsters and villains. And if you are enjoying this podcast, please make a comment, like our videos, share, subscribe. Uh, we cannot wait to continue to dive down this road of fantasy and adventure and story crafting and just really being fantasy nerds and enjoying stories in general with you. So please join us. And we can't wait to see you next time.